Hi, I'm Burke. Uh, I work for Cognizant, and I want to talk to you about Genesis of Things today. And we've developed this together with uh, BigchainDB and, and RWE, um, which is now called InnoG. So you have our three logos up there. And hopefully, after this um, presentation, you'll understand why we called it Genesis of Things. So um, mainly, the topic we're addressing is manufacturing. So the key idea is that the future of manufacturing will be decentral and um, we need and it will, it will be built upon the sharing economy. So the vision is we want to create a, a shared factory um, in the future. So the problem we're addressing is um, actually quite a big one. So um, if you look at the productivity in manufacturing, uh, the problem is that the productivity growth rates have been decreasing for over 30 years. So you can see that here on, these, on this graph that for the key um, countries in Europe and uh, US the, and Japan, the growth rates overall have been declining. Um, but in the future, you know, we're, we're facing the, what we call the fourth manufacturing revolution. So um, in the future, we expect these growth rates to um, significantly increase again, potentially by 10x. And this is basically driven by some major technology shifts, um, basically um, additive manufacturing, so 3D printing. And that's what we're going to talk about today in our solution that's one of the key drivers then we have other aspects like advanced robotics um, augmented reality cybersecurity industrial internet big data simulation so all the advances in these technologies are going to lead to a significant increase of the manufacturing productivity globally and the opportunity space is is quite huge to uh, which can be addressed here and the consequence of this um, development is going to be that the manufacturing sector is going to um, move back from the so Asian countries basically move back home so we're going to have much more decentralized manufacturing micro manufacturing smaller smaller plants sm um, closer to the consumer market um, we're going to have much more mass customization and so multiple products and um, and much more make to order so so this will be the future of manufacturing and uh, that's the problem really we want to address because this decentralized manufacturing model that we'll see is sort of missing fabric fabric of trust to exchange information <clears throat> IP and and products so um, that is actually a key issue especially in, um, in the 3D printing sector. So um, the more specific problems we are addressing are these. So manufacturing today is pretty much a closed shop. So a plant is built within its walls and nobody has access to that. So we want to create an open sourced manufacturing where anybody can borrow a part of a plant, right? So that's one thing. Um, then we see in manufacturing a huge what we call trust tax. So a huge cost related to controlling the entire supply chain, um, like uh, good manufacturing practices, having standards, having certified processes, and then also having certified products that come out at the end of the pipeline. So there's a huge cost related to creating that trust for the end customer to trust the quality of the product. Then we have another big problem, which, which is supply chain transparency. So that's not a given today. There's a lot of fraud in the supply chains. There's a lack of proof of authenticity of um, the product and, um, and proof of ownership. And also um, resource usage is, is suboptimal because of the lack of the um, transparency in the supply chain. And we have another big issue, apparently, which is IP protection. So um, a lot of manufacturing companies keep the IP within their walls and 
treat them as their crown jewels and, and take care that nobody has access to the IP, which is um, an issue because it, it prevents knowledge and knowledge capital from really scaling up globally. And that's one thing that our solution uh, is going to address. So what is um, Genesis of Things? It's um, basically a trusted, encrypted, open platform for the entire 3D printing supply chain. So we, we address this whole manufacturing space first with um, 3D printing only. So we cover the entire supply chain from ordering the material, printing the product, and then shipping it um, back out. And the compli complex part of the supply chain is really the 3D printing process, so generating the IP of how to print um, the product. Because just having a design doesn't mean you can actually print it. The question is, how do you actually print a design? How do you create the print parameters of printing something that works, that has material properties um, that make a good product? And, and that's the IP in the whole 3D printing um, supply chain. So how do you print that? And, and, and that's something that needs to be protected. At the same time, it needs to scale. So you want to monetize your, your, your digital value, which lies in these print parameters globally and scale that up. So that's a bit of a contradiction. You want to protect the IP. At the same time, you want to scale it up. And that's where a blockchain solution um, is, a, is an ideal, ideal solution. Then another thing we're addressing is um, the, what we call the digital product um, memory. So we say every product has a story. So from, from cradle to grave, where was it created? What material uh, were used in the product? Where did the materials come from? Uh, what country, good country, bad country? So. Um, then how is the product produced? What are the, um, the, the specifications? How, you know, what are the, what's the quality data that went into um, the product? And then uh, the ownership. And then also you can add um, well, warranty-related information, but also social information that give life um, to a product. Uh, for example, um, the designers. I'll, sh I'll show you some examples of the digital product memory. Um, so, so basically, the digital product memory will provide an authentic record about the product authenticity. So authentic because it's on the immutable, it's on the blockchain, um, and authenticity of the product. So, so basically, in Genesis of Things, we connect um, some key parties in the supply chain, so the customers, of 3D printed products with designers and with 3D printing um, services providers. So these are the key parties that we connect together um, in this process. So again, on the solution, um, as I mentioned, trusted encrypted platform, um, the idea is that the, um, the print file that includes um, the print parameters, which are the, basically the, the crown jewels, um, will sort of wrap a smart contract around that, and it will become the business. So it can globally scale and be monetized on the global level. Um, at the same time, the IP of that file will stay connected, and we'll make sure uh, that end-to-end -end encryption is there, so we're even um, looking at a solution, a hardware solution based on Intel to, to put um, the print file on a trusted enclave on a um, hardware chip on the 3D printer. Um, digital product memory, I talked about that. This is basically providing the proof of authenticity. Uh, another function is um, crypto payments and escrow function in the whole process. Um, so, so basically the payment for the product will get released only uh, once it is um, printed and shipped out. And in the meantime, the, the amount is uh, in, in, on the blockchain in the, <coughs> in the escrow function. 
Um, then another thing is the royalty accounting. So we enable um, even smaller um, designers to post their designs and get potentially micro royalties for their designs um, over, the, over the blockchain. So that's another thing uh, we enable. So we've started to um, get some lead users um, um, acquainted to this idea. So we have spoken to some fairly significant uh, industrial companies about this, and um, they've sort of validated that you know this is, does address a big problem in the industry. And we've actually raised a lot of interest uh, with some of these major companies. Most of them are German, actually, with this manufacturing. Um, <laughs> I'm German. OK, so this is how it works, basically. Um, again, we have the blockchain um, solution as the underlying, underlying fabric, or the, the uh, almost like the middleware, uh, on which all the actors interact. So we have the customers who order, select and order a product. We have the designers who would put their product on the blockchain. To, uh, we have material providers, of course, who provide the different types of materials for the 3D printing. And we have logistics providers also. So in the next wave, we'll look at the whole supply chain of also looking at telematics, integrating that, and um, integrating the uh, logistics providers as well. And then, of course, we have the 3D, uh, the micro factory or the shared factory with the 3D printers and the product coming out, basically, right? And here, this is sort of based on uh, smart contracts for user configured orders. Um, we have the encrypted design and the micro royalty payments to the designers um, there as part of the solution. So a little bit of um, technology here. So this is basically um, the platforms we're using. It's based on Ethereum. Uh, we have, we're working with BigchainDB, uh, where we put our digital product memory. We're also using IPFS and um, have it on the Azure Cloud um, front end developed by Angular. Did miss anything? Intel Gateway. Uh, we have, okay, QR code printer, and we have NFC tags by Riddle and Code, and that's the next part of the uh, presentation, going to be done by Alvarez, um, which is also a key component um, of the solution. So this is an open innovation project, and we, I think we really benefited from talking and to and involving a lot of uh, really innovative companies in this. Um, so Cognizant and um, RWE is now called InnoG. Uh, BitchainDB, as, as mentioned, uh, very good technology. And then um, EOS is um, a uh, world leading uh, 3D printer company. So they are the guys who, who actually, uh, on, the, on their printers, the, um, for example, the fuel nozzles for GE um, are printed. So it's one of the few companies who can actually produce printers that um, um, create sort of industrial grade um, products in, in steel, but they also have other printers. There are others, so we'll get other, th potentially other 3D printer companies on boarded on this as well. We're working with Intel to provide sort of look at the end-to-end um, -end encryption up t to the printer with the, uh, on the um, trusted enclave. Um, Riddle and code, so we'll do much more about that. And then we have also connected some companies in the 3D printing services world. So 3D or Mind, who have a solution for an enabling um, 3D printing, and uh, and MakerZone, also sort of a 3D printing ecosystem um, company that we're working with to develop basically the business case and, um, and the business. So we have a working prototype for this. Um, also, we were at 
um, DEF CON a couple of weeks ago in Shanghai. Unfortunately, we didn't get into the main event, but we talked to a lot of people and presented our solution there. So um, it's out there. You can actually look at it at um, genesisofthings.com. Um, can't do much with it because you don't have the user credentials. But um, yeah, so the plan is really to take this MVP and uh, we've been testing it with our extreme users and we'll, um, we'll develop a um, feature complete product in the next four months um, for this. Now a little bit on the digital product memory, which um, I already ex explained. And this is really important um, for the manufacturing industry to provide the trust. So uh, you, you, know, um, you need to, so if, if, if the manufacturing industry has transparency about the entire uh, production process, about the materials that went into the process, about the, quality, the, the sensor data of how the product was produced, um, the logistical information also is important. Um, then you can you can really drive change into the entire manufacturing sector if you have that for imagine having that for all the products in one area you can you can ha you have a wealth of information to optimize the um, production process and to optimize products themselves as well. So um, so that's really important for the um, manufacturing industry and what we call industry uh, 4.0 with um, different um, context information that's being gathered, uh, location-based services and, and linking different assets. So the idea of having this um, digital product memory has been out there for probably six or seven years. And it's the core concept of industry 4.0 to really drive smart automation in manufacturing, but sort of at that time when, so this was sort of created by a guy called uh, Professor Walster, the German university. Um, and, but then the blockchain was not there. And uh, so having this on a, on a blockchain, on an immutable record to completely change the game and the functionality of um, having a digital product memory. So here's uh, an example. So we developed this, and uh, this is actually the digital product memory of these small um, cufflinks that we actually printed um, on EOS printers. So over our solution, they were ordered and then uh, printed at EOS. They're, they're um, printed in titanium, and they have a unique ID, and it comes with a QR code, so you can scan that in, and then you can prove authenticity of this, and you can see, um, so this is one piece of information, so who's, who's the owner? Actually, that's Carsten from RWE, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, and and more, more information on there, I think I have a couple of, yeah, so, so for example, who are the designers? These are actually the real designers of this sort of device, has the Ethereum logo on it. Um, where was it printed? And um, for example, of where, how was it shipped? What, what, what did the uh, logistics for this piece look like? So um, uh, we've actually done that, realized that for, for this cufflink, and I thought it's sort of an interesting example of really how to re digitally represent the physical world, and we've created a solution that you can actually touch and hold uh, in your hands. <laughs> you guys gave me number 47. <laughs> right, I don't know what number this is, but 47 is pretty good. Keep it, price will go up. <laughs> Our business model, so um, we want to we want to create this ecosystem, this fabric for 3D printing as a as an open platform. So we want to have traffic on it. We want people to join in. And uh, the idea is to have bolt-on business models on top of that, uh, which we will monetize. So there is exa some examples are here. So you can have services based on this for the proof of printability. So that's an important concept that, you know, ha as I said in the beginning, having a 
good design doesn't mean it's printable or doesn't mean it's, it's printable in a way that the product actually works. So you need to provide in your offer of offering a product that's printable, you need to provide a proof of printability. And there are service companies who already do that and provide that to different levels. So that could be one idea of a sort of a bolt-on service on this platform. Uh, print parameter optimization also. So there are already companies that take 3D printed products, scan them in. So you can um, scan the geometry of the product. You can also uh, do a computer tomography and get into the, in, in the, in the inside. But um, you can optimize these parameters and actually print um, a better product of the scan. So there are people who do that. That's pretty interesting. And then uh, digital product. So certification is a really big thing in 3D printing and in manufacturing. Apparently, you need to print certified products by certain industry regulators. Um, OK, the digital product memory, I talked about that. Then uh, we could have industry-specific solutions and um, and we can also put trade finance on top of this. So trade finance and factory. So these are just some ideas of bolt on business models that um, uh, we, would, we would use. Yeah, and as I showed you, it's a reality. Um, yeah, and, and that's it for this. My name is Alvaro Mier. I am a CEO at Retail and Code. And uh, oh, sorry, yes. And in this presentation, I will, I will try to explain you why we do what we do and obviously how we do it. So, um, at Retail and Code, we see that there is a problem of um, identification and authentication of both uh, people and objects, and um, this problem has gone even bigger um, since you know, things have become smart and now they talk to each other and they make decisions of an, on their own. I can give you a lot of examples like e-health sensors, IoT devices, wearables, high frequency trading, etc. So from our perspective, all these devices, they have become now like full active members of our society. And um, we believe that there is a need of a platform for digital governance and policies to make this new society sustainable. So we believe that the blockchain is the solution for this. And, uh, but we have wit witnessed also that in the past few years that uh, there is a lot of companies that are trying to safely store digital records on the blockchain that most of the times they refer to physical objects, um, objects on the real world. And how they bridge these two worlds together is not well resolved. Uh, there are many companies that are using QR codes, pop codes, uh, tagging systems, um, NFC chips, and as you know, all of these systems, they are easily compromisable in one way or another. You can take a QR code and just peel it off and place it in another product. Uh, you can just read information in st stored into an NFC chip and, uh, and so on, okay? So at Twitter and Code, what we have done is we have um, we have invested the past three years in creating an unbreakable link between the blockchain and the physical world, the real world. So basically, we have developed what I was talking at the beginning, this platform for digital governance and, and policies. And in this environment, you can be assured that the product you buy is from the expected provenance, the IoT device is behaving according to the expected rules, and your personal data is used according to your own interests. And to do, the, to do so, we have developed what we call the TACTOC, which is an active tagging and token system working like a micro blockchain processor. The word TACTOC derives from the combination of TAC and token. And uh, just simply put together, <laughs> straight to the point. And uh, it's a double hardware um, authentication and identification system, which allows anyone to prove provenance, ownership, and contract fulfillment. So in one side, one second. So here's the tag talk. It's not a white paper. It's not a uh, PowerPoint. It's a real product or already produced. 
And uh, so this will get embedded. You see it's flexible board. I will talk about the properties of this later on. And um, this gets embedded into any physical object. And when I mean embedded, it's under the layers. Uh, it could be cotton, uh, leather, wood, wherever it might be. Or you can get easily attached to it. You can easily glue it to it. So if someone tries to peel it off, the antenna will break. And next time the tag talk gets uh, activated, it will get destroyed. We don't uh, store information or reference into the tag talk. It's, as I said, it's, a, it's an active tagging and token system. So I talked about the tag. And we also have the token. And the token is also, um, we call it sometimes like the, amul like the amulet. So it's meant that um, anyone can carry it around. And only when the TAC and the token, they get together, physical contact, they run a cryptographic process, the so-called challenge response mechanism, which is a re on real time, it's, it sends a string message, which has to be signed by the private keys of the TAC and the token. <clears throat> so, um, so if you have a product which has the TAC, and you have the token, you can easily prove that the provenance of the product, you can prove that you are the, the rightful owner, and uh, you can also have access to the extended services. Um, or let me put it in another way. If you have a product which doesn't have the tag or you don't have the token, it's because it's a fake one, it's not an authentic one, or it's because you, um, it's, you're not a legitimate owner. And uh, so this system makes it super secure, it's a totally new way to build identity systems, and it represents the physical objects in a unique way in, a, in the digital space. Regarding, um, well, something that is very important also is that in this uh, tactile, I mean, we are capable to embed into the product itself a smart contract, and this make it, makes them very convenient. Um, this uh, mainly, I mean, any company which uses TACTOG to secure its product it also allows to enrich them out also because they can carry on relevant contracts. Um, and this makes a lot of benefit, not only for our industrial partners, but also to the final customer. Um, so let me give you a couple examples. You can embed into a watch itself, for example, the right to, to, to have a free service a year, or in a work, or, or a work piece of art, uh, when the ownership has to change from one person to another. Or, for example, in an e-health sensor, who is the one who is allowed to read your information? <clears throat> and regarding, just now going a little bit more into the physical properties and the, uh, technical, pro and the technical properties, TACTOC is the world first open source, blockchain agnostic, and Arduino environment compatible tagging system. This means that um, we use any blockchain. It can be Ethereum, Bitcoin, wherever it might be. Um, it's open source because we know that only open sourcing uh, can make this, this technology big. And we plan to open source this technology in three, four weeks. And we will be capable to release this and sell it through a platform. Um, and uh, we are Arduino environment compatible. So. Um, you will be capable to use Arduino to control and do a lot of cryptographic uh, crazy stuff. So this means that, um, for example, you could use, I mean, this itself, for example, to encrypt and decrypt messages um, uh, from your daily used apps. And uh, this encryption and decryption happens off the bus. Um, so only the person who gets the, the, the key can, uh, can have access to the message. Or you can use it as a key of to, for example, to access to your computer or wherever it might be. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that there will be a lot of ideas. And um, so here's a list of uh, another properties that's, that the product has. And uh, I would like to point out uh, three of them. The first of them is that we work with, with like an energy harvesting system. We don't use um, battery. Uh, this means that we work like through induction, and um, it gets power enough to, to, to power sensors, for example. And um, <clears throat> on the other side, we are uh, 
PKI is a public key infrastructure compatible with uh, NFC. Uh, this is very convenient for the industry. And, um, and finally, the private key is kept private. So the initial interchange of, of, of the keys. Because um, when provisioning, I mean the key, the private key is only known to the hardware. It's not even known to us, to read and code. So when the hardware is provisioned, um, <clears throat> this is then um, the first time when the crypto chip is initiated. And so we, we, we use this for signatures. And uh, so I'm going to show you an example here, a video, and um, this is a, I'm going to show you a, a CP, this is a CPU, and you're going to see uh, a test of the Arduino compatible driver controlling the crypto chip, and also how the crypto chip is able to write provisioning data into the onboard NFC. It's a little bit homemade, sorry, for the quality. <laughs> So you have the tactic there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is all the technical guys gave me. And um, <clears throat> so, as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> this has multiple applications, and uh, you can use as anti-counterfeit solution for the luxury market, for any product that you want to protect. It can be used as a know your machine for the IoT industry. It can secure your personal data. As I said at the beginning, you can have private conversations. I mean, not anonymous, but private conversations. And um, you can innovate in the business in development. For example, you can use uh, the tag talk to uh, tag a vault where you put, for example, minor metals, gold or whatever, and you can sign, sign it um, and introduce the information into the blockchain and then create certificates and exchange them with whoever you want to and with, of any value. And uh, regarding the, the project, we are developing with, uh, with our partners here, um, Cognizant and RWE. Um, obviously, our product will get, I mean, the idea is that our product will get embedded into all the products or most of the products that they will get printed with the 3D printers. And um, so we, we provide this digital product memory. I mean, we are capable to ensure that the product is being produced in one place and there is a, with a certain, under certain circumstances or under certain specifications. and. Um, <clears throat> And also to prove the, the, the ownership and uh, in case so, to access uh, extended services. And um, so mainly how this works, I mean, um, before manufacturing any product, we will deliver our tag talks uh, to the uh, manufacturer, to the 3D printers. And um, we then create a multi, uh, one multi-signature blockchain ID entry for that tag talk, combining the producer, producer ID, the ownership ID, and the product ID. Uh, afterwards, I mean, when the, the customer gets the product, they will get a token also together with it, so they can hold it themselves. Um, and um, and any time they want, the, I mean, having the, the product with an embedded tag and the token, they can prove the, um, the authenticity of the product that they are the, legitimate owner, and uh, access to customer services. And um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. question, <laughs> Damien. Uh, I've got one question for you. It's around uh, quality control. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how you embed that into the process. Quality control. Product quality control. So when the product is printed, how do you control the right. quality so of the... Quality control. So during the manufacturing process, you have 
sensors that are monitoring the manufacturing process, right, and create data about how the manufacturing process is being executed. So that data will go on the digital product memory or on the blockchain basically. So that's trusted data that's coming directly from um, those QA devices, right, and from the source. So whoever buys the product will have the original data of those quality devices that monitor the manufacturing process of that specific product. You'll have that, you'll know exactly whether you know, there's any tolerances and so forth. So it's important for industrial products, apparently high tech, um, but also, I mean, you can, it's also important for, for consumer products in the end, right? Potentially, so, uh, so we're looking at the industrial products at first, yeah. And the other question was <laughs> around the fantastic uh, product that you've created, but I was just wondering, what is the, what is the environment cost of this type of product? You know, what, what, what's... Uh, the cost of the tactile? The, not the cost, uh, the monetary cost, but in terms of producing that at a large scale, what would it cost, you know, to, to produce it for any, any product? You know, what, is it sustainable? Is it something that you can do? Yes, I mean... Um, the price for, for this, you mean to produce it in a scale, right? No, the price for the planet. For them? The price for the environment. environment. For recycling. For them? Recycling. Recycling. Yeah, yeah. If you make billions of them. Okay. And, um... <laughs> 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 oh my God, this answer they don't break. You don't need to recycle them. <laughs> yes, um, I mean... I'm not sure I got a good question, right? Um, so um, this is, this can be embedded, this is flexible, this is also unbreakable. And uh, if you get, I mean, if, if this breaks, do you just get a, a new one, like a, like, like a, for example? I didn't get the, the, the no, question. The, the green factor, the green the environmental ecology, factor. How ecology, ecology. 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 Can you recycle it? You recycle it. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I haven't thought about this. Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I haven't thought about this. <laughs> Recycling? <laughs> Recycling. Okay. I mean, is it er environmentally safe or how do you, if you have millions of those, what does it do to the environment? Hello? <laughs> I had a question for the shared factory. <clears throat> yeah. The question is, like, nowadays, I think uh, we live in a consumer world where the producers of any product, they try to reduce their cost as much as possible. Like, look at Primark, like, people like, go there a lot because products are cheap. So the question is, how would you uh, motivate or, like, uh, producers to use that technology? Because it's, it costs money, right, to put these trackers all, all over the place and also to make shared factories I don't really think it would make it cheaper to produce the product because now you just put it factory in China. And so, so how do you think this <coughs> technology will gr grow? What are the financial uh, like motivation for companies? Right. So this will reduce the manufacturing cost. So I mean, this is related to the fourth revolution or revolution of manufacturing will significantly reduce the manufacturing cost because of those new technologies like um, 3D printing. For example, for the 3D printing of a fuel nozzle is four times more productive than producing it um, conservatively, right? Uh, with with um, uh, basically tw you need 20 parts to build a fuel nozzle if you do it without 3D printing and 3D printing is just one part. So the productivity goes up significantly and at significantly lower cost. And all the other factors that drive the fourth manufacturing revolution, right, like um, big data, the industrial internet, and so forth, will also drive down the prices. So we'll see significantly um, lower cost. And then also we'll see significantly more participants in the whole manufacturing ecosystem, we'll see small companies, we'll see individuals who create their own micro factories with one sort of fabricator uh, built by themselves that can connect to this ecosystem and, and fabricate products and sell it to the market. So it's all going to 
increase transparency of cost and pricing and increase competition and will lead to significantly lower, lower cost in manufacturing, actually. Yeah. Hi. So I have a question for Genesis of Things. On the, on the cufflinks, it's my ignorance of how 3D printing works, but if you print, say, a billion <laughs> uh, cufflinks, how do you tell each one apart? Like, are they not all exactly the same if they've been 3D printed? Well, they, I mean, it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of hard to put a unique identifier on a million. So for the parts we printed for the showcase, which is about 100, we have a unique identifier on here. This is a binary number here on the side. But the idea is to have um, a unique code on the, on the code from Riddle and Code that we would put on products where you can fit it on, right? And it's sort of difficult. Um, there are ideas of how you can print a unique code into the 3D printed structure that is machine readable. So there's some research going on how to sort of read variation in the print parameters uh, with a scanner. So that's pretty innovative and that's possible in the future. So we'll be able to have a unique ID for every single product. That's the idea. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, one is around, um, so my understanding is this, it allows you to essentially um, look at provenance, right, of how, yeah. where, where it comes from yeah. um, and so on and so forth. So um, for it to be legally mandated that you know, XYZ is actually this product, you need, for example, a standards body which recognizes that um, these are the parameters which define this object. So in, in your example, who do you see as the standards body? Is it, is there, are there ones which are already set up for 3D printing industry? And, and which will essentially mandate that, you know, for example, if someone tries to replicate and it doesn't match that identity, they can then go to the standards body and say that, you know, this is not working. So um, is, this, is this actually a valid, trans valid um, product or not? Uh, the other question is, um, in terms of adoption rate, how, how quickly do you think, um, especially in the areas or the countries that you've worked in, uh, this technology being adopted by um, uh, the, the wider uh, set of companies? The, the, our platform or 3D printing? Um, the platform. The platform. I mean, it's a good question. We're trying to <laughs> working on that apparently to see how much, uh, how the business model can evolve. But we have received really good feedback from our um, sort of first users. Some of the names you've seen, and I think if they adopt it. Um, Mm, and those are big companies, then we'll see a lot of other companies following because these are sort of flagship users. But we also think that this is going to be a solution for the mid-market, so not, the big, not only the big industrial companies who would potentially want to create their own ecosystem and not sort of put it on a wide basis of participation because they still believe they should protect their IP. So, but there is a, there's a good mid-market of... Um, innovative um, te technical engineering companies um, that will want to adopt this. We've tested it with smaller companies also. So I think the adoption rate um, should be, you know, uh, um, I, I think in three years we'll have probably, um, well, I, I don't want to say and mention any numbers, but I think we'll have a, we'll have a pretty good adoption rate within um, three years. If we have some early uh, leaders who adopt it, we'll have a lot of followers. Um, yeah. In terms of standards? And I'm, I didn't quite get the question. So you, these, mm, yeah. so, so how do you prove that a product is? So for example, in the di I think Everledger, what they're doing is they, they've partnered with the Diamond um, uh, yeah, Association yeah. and yeah. their standards determine w w what, what essentially the properties of diamonds have to be. Uh, when they're putting it on the blockchain. So with regards to the different products that will be uh, on the blockchain, yeah. e every one of them have to be recognized by a set of standards which are essentially digitized. So I'm just wondering, in, in your case, when you're working with these technologies, are you having to work with different standard bodies or are you the mm, standard body? No, we didn't start with that yet. I think we're going to have certifications of certain products which will have to be provided by standard bodies and we'll put these certifications on the digital product memory, so they will certify 
a design and they will certify the print parameters and that certification will be part of the digital product memory and then with your key you can authenticate whether you have a certified product or not. That's the idea. Um, so I want to say a few things about you know what was discussed before, the environment. So basically in your case if you have a small tag like that it's not really harmful for the environment because that's the cost of having a seal. So when you buy a very expensive bottle of wine, you have a seal, or when you buy a phone on the case, you have uh, 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 like a hologram seal. So what's the cost of, uh, cost of you know, uh, producing seals? It's not that much. Now, I have another question about 3D printed objects. Are you looking at um, having on the blockchain a way to dismantle those objects and use the plastic, the PLA, and um, recycle the PLA and produce new filler because I think there is a technology where you can recycle the 3D, 3D printed objects. Have you thought of that? Have you looked in, into that? Yes, so I mean the idea is that you through the digital product memory you would be able to know um, where in what products, where in the world do you have recyclable products? Yeah, yeah for example. Yeah. And, um, and then you could basically initiate a, a recycling supply chain on that data to, to collect these items, to sort of check how old are they, maybe should they be recycled soon, and then you can sort of invoke a recycling process of these 3D printed products. And that's really the charm of the digital product memory because I've been working a little bit in um, in recycling, right? And especially titanium and this cufflink is made in titanium. That's something that needs to be recycled and you need to know where are those products uh, that have titanium in them and how to recycle them. So I think we can see a lot of innovation in the recycling supply chain based on you know, having this digital product memory for 3D printed products, especially metals. Yeah, perfect. Hi there. Could you um, explain a bit more about the um, about the model, the model around the, um, the trade finance factoring that was mentioned on your um, chart? How that works in your business? Trade finance, so, um, so if we have the whole supply chain related data at, coming from the source in the digital product memory, we have the information that is relevant for trade finance because it describes the product, it describes the owner and the material where it came from, so a lot of things you would need to enable the, to secure the trade finance process is on the digital product memory, on an immutable record that is trusted. So you take a lot of cost out of the trade finance process, which involves a lot of checking, insurance, and, and so forth and so on. On All that is on this digital product memory with you know, source, trusted source data. And I think we can, with that, we can really disrupt um, trade finance. But the, I mean, the, for trade finance, there are a lot of blockchain-based uh, models, thinking, and solutions already out there. But I think with you know this information, we can really boost that as well. Um, what, what your presentation reminded me a lot of uh, Balaji's presentation of 21.co about the machine payable web. I don't know if you've seen it, but essentially the idea is that the third wave of the web is that objects now can have their own balances, digital currency yeah. balances, yeah. effectively. But in your presentation, I saw reference to payments and things, but I didn't see you talk about digital currency balances. In other words, objects having their own uh, digital currency balances, effectively, and having their own ownership. Because for the first time, machines can own money. And historically, yeah. only humans have been able to have money balances. But now machines can have money balances because of Bitcoin and digital currencies, yeah. which seems to me to be 
an aggregation or an addition or an augmentation of your model, but you, you don't seem to have envisaged that or, or mentioned No, it. no, no, absolutely. I mean, this could be one of the bolt-on business models. So um, that's one thing we are really thinking about is sort of the, the unbanked machines, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, so you're going to have autonomous machines and uh, in an, we, we, we can think about this shared factory as an as in as a DAO, right? As a uh, yeah, the machines can pay each other. Yeah, basically. the machines can pay each other. Um, exactly. So so uh, we, we are thinking about that. That sort of an um, evolvement of of the solution. But but absolutely, yeah. Hi, um, I have the first question for Riddle and Code. So, um, do you necessarily need to physically connect the tag talk to read the information on it, or do you already have a kind of wireless technology to do it? Um, and then, and a, <coughs> sorry, another question for uh, the other company. Um, what is the uh, tolerance uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, size, I mean, you show uh, the cufflinks made of titanium, which are pretty cool. But you know, normally titanium is used to make a uh, very um, precise engineering piece. So, um, how precise can a three D printed object be? Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, how precise? I think it's. I forgot the number. And it's. Um, in the micrometers, it's not nano yet, right? But it's improving, and there is new technologies, not not for metals yet, that are um, that are much more precise. Um, and um, there, yeah. So the three D printing market is really evolving. So even the the speed of printing and the the surfaces are, are getting much better. So that's that's as much as I can say right now. Yeah. Yeah, so usually there are sort of, it, it doesn't end with the 3D printing, so there's post-processing uh, of 3D printed parts, uh, depending on what it is. So these cufflinks were not post-processed, and they're a little bit rough, but um, so in the real jewelry industry, you typically post-process jewelry to make it more shiny, right? Uh, or you put some color on it. So there is post-processing, yeah. Not for yeah, everything. That affects the accuracy of the so yeah. Otherwise, you do the, the mirror image, you do like stereo quickly, and then put it past. And then uh, the titanium is sort of more uh, like the usual way, and then sort of find out. Yeah. That's yeah. the best that I think you said. That, I didn't get that the question. Stereo laser sintering for those yeah, 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 yeah. So <coughs> that's laser sintering. Yeah, this is laser centered. Yeah. Oh, well, no, there's, there's just obviously there's different ways of doing 3D printing, and, and some printing requires post printing sort of refinement. And as yeah. jewelry, all jewelry is, is refining an, an object, isn't it? You know, making it more shiny or softer. Or, yeah. But in terms of accuracy, obviously, if, uh, what I was saying was if it was printed with stereo um, lithography, you can produce casts, and then yeah. you have the negative, and then you print, yeah. which would be far more accurate and less refinement there will be some. But with stereo laser sintering, how you've produced it, to answer this chap's question, that's less accurate yeah. because each bit of titanium is surrounded by yeah. a bit of polymer, which is yeah, fused. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I want to answer a question that was pending before. And did you ask if we, we need to have a physical contact or also we support a wireless, right? And uh, <coughs> the, question, the answer is yes. We have uh, different models depending on um, the use case, right? So um, um, basically the token, it makes it more powerful to the solution and can give you access to extended services. Uh, but um, you can also have a tag talk, which will only be a one hardware, which will get embedded into the product and then with an NFC, uh, you can read the information. 
a question about TAC talk. Um, here. Where? Okay. Uh, I didn't understand how do you attach TAC talk to a physical good in uncompromisable way. Say I'm producing jewelry, how would I attach TAC talk to a golden chain? Okay, so um, regarding, for example, gold, there will be some specific, very little, we have very little limitations in what um, in what we say, I mean, I mean, about embedding the product. For example, in that case, it cannot be embedded, but um, you can, it can get attached. I mean, if the gold is very small, I mean, our tag dog, it can get as small as it can get. It cannot get s small and smaller, so, I mean. How do you do it in uncompromisable way? I mean, you, you, you just, you could just glue it to the gold piece of, a piece of a piece of gold that you have, and then if you try to peel it off, then the antenna will break. And um, next time you try to read the information or you try to um, initiate it, then it will destroy uh, itself. And then when you do that, then you will you will find out that the product has been got uh, devalidated. It loses all its credentials. Yes. <clears throat> How do you prevent me sticking a new antenna on the device? Sorry? How do you prevent me sticking a new antenna uh, on the device? Sticking a new antenna on the device? If it's compromised, can you stick a new one? Um, my disclaimer, I'm not a CTO. <laughs> 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 so I, 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 I don't can... I think this is going to work. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> I'm sure we have an answer for that. Uh, but. Um, I can take that question and maybe answer it for you later on. Yes, yes, it's already compromised, so you cannot, that's right. Sorry? Yes. Sorry? It's tested and verified? Sorry, can you say it louder? Is it? If it's sorry, security <laughs> tested. Um, security tested. By I mean, expert. by by an expert. Yeah. Um, no, it's been tested by yourself. <laughs> also. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about the genesis of things. So, um, in a sort of scenario where I was a customer and I wanted to make something, I would uh, get into a contract with uh, the designer and the material producer and the 3D printer um, in a sort of like contract where all the parties will be party to this one contract. Is that correct? Is that how it's supposed to work? Yeah. And then what if one of those parties defaults like in some way, they, you know, like uh, maybe the material producer uh, you know, uh, claims to say this yeah. is a certain grade and it's not. And we only know after that, you know, um, so one solution that I can think of is that everyone would then put a deposit, every party to the contract would put a deposit that would be, you know, forfeited if they have just, you know, um, done something wrong. Another way is to have someone else be impartial, uh, be also a party to the contract to adjudicate whether who should be yeah so awarded. that's that's part of the escrow function on the blockchain right so the payment is only done to the various people once the whole transaction is certified to be complete right and the, so that the designer also only gets their royalties if the product was actually printed and the material provider as well so that's all sort of in the escrow function so people you know um, so in that case, then there should be some sort of reputation, reputation system. Um, like, let's say, you know, because now the designer is taking on the risk of working yeah. with, yeah. you know, yeah. somebody they don't know. And so that's, a good, that's a good thought. And exactly. So I think based on this, we're going to have um, reputation systems. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So that could be another bolt on uh, uh, solution. And of course, we thought about that. I mean, you have sort of reputations for the for the printers, right? So we have printers of print service companies on the blockchain and we have certain printers that have sort of um, a reputation. So a machine will have a reputation for printing a high quality product or it would even have a certification 
or in the smart contract you could see that a certain printer could with a certain material can print a certain level of quality and that would be also certified and that's sort of part of the uh, reputation system for the printers for example and designers can have reputations as well So uh, would there be, you know, someone that stands in between to I sort of like say um, that that this identity on the blockchain belongs to this particular company in real life because they could use multiple identities on the blockchain, right? It's the same yeah. Thing yeah. So how do you do reputation systems when you can? Again, I didn't get that. How do you do reputation systems? How do you do reputation systems? So let's say I'm a crooked like uh, materials provider and yeah. I and I and I and I. And I have one account on the blockchain, and I trade with these people, and then I screw them over. And then I have another account, and I trade with them. Like, who, you know, how do you do reputation in that sense? Um, I, so, we whenever really, you create an account, you have to pay some money. We haven't really completely yeah. thought that through, I guess, but. Um, I think we'll have, we'll have. Um, certification body, so there is going to be some physical checking. This is not going to be a completely um, digital model because of some mm, regulators in between certification agencies that need to provide a certificate, so they need to um, be part of the story, right? And, um, and how to how to game the system. Um, well, uh, I think we'll have to think about that a little bit more, but um, basically, you know, you can, this, the solution provides transparency from the source. So we'll have, um, like I said, QA devices who will measure uh, the quality of a print, for example. And for the incoming material, we will also have sort of, um, descriptions of the material and the provenance that will be on the from the source on the digital <laughs> product memory which will provide some level of trust into the system in terms of who delivered this and also um, in combination with uh, the logistics partners who will track and trace the, the logistics of the product you can also identify fraud if the whole supply chain is not validated on the digital product memory. So that's one way also of preventing fraud, that all the data that makes sense uh, is, is on the digital product memory and then you can check and authenticate that. Next question. Hi, good evening, Robert. Um, I was just curious about your systems and procedures for replacing damaged or faulty uh, modules. Damn it. Yeah. Oh. I buy a bag or, and it's faulty. Can, can you repeat the question again, please? Yeah. Elder? Your procedure to replace the systems and procedures within your company to replace faulty or damaged antennae or modules? Oh, this is pretty simple. I mean, we can, we can um, just um, create a new one, just like a, when you lose your credit card. So we can do the same, just issue a new one, make the new entrance in the blockchain and deliver it to the right person. Um, yeah, going back to the platform, so do you distinguish between what's created um, onto the blockchain when you're undertaking the manufacturing and the operational data that comes out, what you, comes out of what you've actually made, which enables it to be repaired, serviced during the life cycle of the product? Because that data during the life cycle is a lot more than what you're creating here. So where is the edge network? Where's the aggregation? How are you funneling that? Uh, a typical jet engine, for example, will, uh, if you manufacture that, it's creating terabytes. Yeah. So how, how is that working? I didn't really see that in the platform that you had. Right, so a, a jet engine will consist of many parts. I think we'll have... Um, the information of each part of the jet engine on the digital product memory. And um, 
Yeah, so we're we're looking at apparently it's um, a lot of information, and we need to I think for the different products we need to determine uh, what data actually will go on the digital product memory. So we can't have everything on there. I think it's going to be, you know, it needs to be negotiated um, with the partners who are putting their products on the digital product memory, what part of the information um, should go on there. And um, I think it's going to take some experimentation and it's also the, the use of the data is going to be critical. You know, there's going to be lots of uses and there's going to be lots of data that will have no use also. And we need to, we need to take that data out and provide just the data that is going to be important to to do certain things, to optimize the product itself, um, to prove the proper functioning and, and probably data that is related to, to warranties and insurances and data that's related to efficiencies of the manufacturing process, right? And I think we could run some AI on, on the data to find out what data is really important here. So we're not going to be, you know, sort of a dumb engine that collects all the data, but only the smart data about the product. Okay, any more questions? One more, yeah? Um, I just got one question regarding the supply chain um, device. For instance, if we talk about the retail, yeah, I understand how it's done. The uh, tangible items, I do understand. What about the intangible, where, which I mean like liquid or oil, for instance, uh, in oil shipment? Uh, where happening aggregation and disaggregation of the oil when for instance you have two tankers and from two tankers into one there is aggregation happening how are you going to uh, pro uh, identify proof of the of the good because basically it's actually creating the new product so and and uh, I understand how you can track and trace the cargo because it's going to be once it's going to be placed into the containers is easy, but when min mixing containers and also in the shipping industry, in the oil shipping industry, sometimes the route changes, trading changes, uh, the consequences changes. Uh, how do you think it's applicable for that industry, or it has to be something else developed? It's the next stage in your kind of uh, idea. <coughs> I mean, um, I think it's applicable, applicable, applicable for that industry also. I mean, we will make sure that. Uh, the information which is stored in the blockchain is true. I mean, whether it's a new product because you mix two, two products together, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter to us, right? I mean, it's, it's if you mix oil with another type of oil and then it becomes something else, we will do that entry into the blockchain. So <laughs> you make sure that um, actually that product is the mixture of those two products. So, and you just have to do the same as any other container. You will just uh, tag the, the container or or use it as a locker if you want uh, for the container, and that's it. It will be it will be the same situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.